Amen. This thing is amazing this morning. Well, you guys have come to worship. All right. Well, guys, good morning again. It's so good to have you all here. So excited to be here with you as well. We're continuing our series on what? The book of Genesis. And so if you're a guest here today, grab your Bible or sit next to someone who has a Bible with you. We are a Bible church. You're not just coming to hear me speak. My goal is to show you the word of God this morning so we can apply it to our lives. Amen. So good, as you know, that uh, we have two souls have come to be baptized today. Uh, Crystal has come to be baptized today. So good to have her family here with her as well. And then Alfred's come, Marika's husband's come to be baptized today. And so it is going to be a great day in the Lord. I mean, we've already seen Anita graduate from CR. I mean, guys. This is one of those days where I truly believe we'll remember for a long time. Um, and it's so encouraging for me, too, because my dear friend Nelson is here with us today. Nelson is my barber. Remember what I talked about? And I'm like, and he came today. And so we, we all we all been trying. We're trying he kind of he cuts like everybody's hair now. <laughs> and so it's so good to have you here. And uh, I, I, it's, it's encouraging, too, because God willing, we're going to get him to come back. He wants to come back again for our Latin service on March 2nd. So please, please be praying for that. Turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 17. We're going to hit Luke before we get to Genesis. You'll see why in just a second. Now, last week, we looked at, the sermon was called, The Way of Cain. Again, it just sounds like a movie, you know, like, like, like some ominous movie, right? The way of Cain. But really, we understand with Cain killing his brother Abel, before he actually went that far, his way was a way of rebellion to God. It was a way of resentment. And it was also a way of rejecting responsibility. Because remember he said, who is my brother? To God, when he was actually questioned where Abel was. And so today we're going to take a look at one of the most familiar events in the Bible, Noah's Ark and the Flood. But before we do, take a look at Luke 17, because Jesus has something to say about that. Um, as you're turning there, it's interesting. I was doing some research uh, for the message today, and um, in Frostburg, Maryland, there's actually a church known as God's Ark of Safety, and they are constructing a church building in the shape of an ark as a sign to the world of God's love and the soon return of Jesus. But people have even taken it a step further. Um, back in 2012, just a year or two ago, a Dutchman in the Netherlands named Johan Hubers com completed a four-year project to build a replica of Noah's Ark according to biblical proportions. All right, do we have, do we have the uh, pictures up, bro? Let me know when you're ready. But I, I want to show you here. This is the ark he built. You see the giraffe up there? This is the ark of biblical proportions. I'm like, whoa. This is now my screensaver right there. And so it's interesting. He's, he's filled the ark, which operates as now a Bible museum with life-size plastic animals. You kind of wonder how the giraffe was kind of just standing there on the edge right there. But he, he's got life-size plastic animals and an aviary of live birds to give visitors more to interact with. It weighs 3,000 tons. Uh, and the boat contains sleeping quarters, a theater, a restaurant, and a conference facility to seat 1,500 people. So, I mean, what's, really, what's pretty awesome is that since we're part of a worldwide fellowship, you know we have a, a remnant group in Amsterdam. So... I was pretty fired up when I saw this. I'm like, man, I need to go visit the church in Amsterdam. <laughs> Not just because you want to go see the ark, okay? But that is pretty awesome right there. And so the title of the message this morning is simply chosen to build the ark. Chosen to build the ark. And I have a question for you this morning. What are you building? What are you building in your life right now? Um, are you building a family? Kind of like what the Hardens and the Williams are doing right now as they prepare to give birth to their new children coming. Um, are you building a career? 
Are you building a marriage? Are you with me here? All these things in our life are very important, wouldn't you say so? Absolutely. They're vital, right? But the reality is, that's the same priorities the world has. What makes you any different than the world? The world is trying to build a family. The world is trying to build a marriage. Well, sadly, over 50, 60 percent ends in divorce now because they don't have God in their lives. Um, the world absolutely is trying to build careers. And all those things are important. That's why we go to the Ivy League schools. That's why we go ahead and want to exceed and be ambitious. But if you're a Christian, you're also called to be distinct. You're called to have an eternal significance above the world. Because all this is STBA. It's scheduled to burn anyway. You with me here? And so just like how the World Trade Center towers fell, there's going to be a lot of stuff being built today that will be ashes. And so let's read here in Luke 17 and see Jesus' perspective on it. Luke 17, verse 26. Luke 17, verse 26, the Bible says this. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating. Okay, so people ate back then and we eat today, don't we? People were drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. So you can imagine, like, you know, like just like we have today, you know, people, they're, they're actors. There's movies, there's plays. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on back then. Marry all this stuff. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the most famous archaeologists today, I think his name is Richard Barres, he, he actually found the Titanic. He says now he's found evidence for the flood. And many, many scholars who aren't even Christians have found this based upon the strata of the earth and all these different things. And so, you know, me being a science major from Cornell in grad school, like, I, I like to study stuff out. Because the Bible isn't just blind faith. You got to have conviction. And so it's interesting here because as I looked at this, Jesus is basically saying long ago, similar to now, people were busy. They're busy doing stuff. Important stuff, but stuff. Sadly, stuff that didn't necessarily have an eternal significance. And so if you're a guest here this morning, the question you got to ask yourself is, are you ready to meet God? If the world ended today, would you be ready? Kind of like the people in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina came. Yeah. Oh yeah, we'll be fine. Then you see bodies floating in the streets. Everyone thinks it would never happen to them. Oh, we're in the World Trade Center towers. We're in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And two planes come and bring them down. I'm invincible, really. I bet you that guy who just died, Paul Walker, yes. in that car crash, thought he was too. Fast and furious. That's the way people are living their lives. Fast and furious. I got to go build my, I got to go do my thing. But are they ready when the storm, when the storms in their life come a brewing? Turn over to Genesis chapter 6. For the Christians here, we need to kind of really study out what the days of Noah are all about. And how this applies to us. Because if Noah was chosen to build the ark, the question is, are you chosen? Because if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are chosen to make a difference. You are chosen to build God's spiritual ark, his church. Because the day is going to come when the door is going to close and nobody else will be able to get in. Let's take a look here in Genesis chapter 6. Remember now, Last time we examined Genesis together, we left off at the end of chapter 4. I didn't forget. And so to briefly sum up the genealogy of chapter 5, we see the consequences of Adam and Eve's disobedience here basically play out in the lives of their descendants. Adam and Eve's disobedience, after Cain, rather, murdered his brother Abel, his son, Lamech, breaks the pattern of monogamous marriage 
Because you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, polygamy is in the Bible. No, actually God created Adam and Eve. It was a monogamous, monogamous relationship, right? Between a man and a woman, not Adam and Steve, Adam and Eve. Then we see here that after Cain murdered his brother Abel, his son, Cain's son Lamech, breaks the pattern of monogamous marriage and now takes two wives. You see how sin has just started to develop more and more and more and more now. And justifies the murder of a young man for injuring him, showing that the sinful nature of our human society is all too clear. But then another son is born to Adam and Eve. His name is Seth. And at least some in his line call on the name of the Lord. Centuries pass. God keeps track of this godly line of Seth. And it's interesting here, you can see all the different people and how long they live, like Methuselah and all these, and you, you kind of wonder, wow, there's a lot of... He gives all the different names of people and all the amount of time they lived. And that's pretty significant, because you know, you wonder like, okay, this guy lived how many years? 800 years? Like, that's, that's crazy. Like, how does, how does that work? Right? So I looked it up. I studied it out. Apparently, many cultures have stories of long lives for ancestors who lived prior to a great flood. And the whole thinking here with scientists is that some have suggested that a heavy cloud cover um, that cut off radiation was eventually taken out after the flood. That, so that heavy cloud co cover, they think, that stopped radiation to be able to reach the human beings enabled them to live longer. But then after the flood, that, that, base, that um, cloud cover dissipated. And so it's really interesting stuff. All right, just cool to study it on out. Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Do you see that today? And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created. From the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, let's stop here. So, as the earth's population grew here, so did wickedness and immor immorality. And it says, God was grieved that every inclination of man was evil. He was so pained by the evil in man that he decided to rid them from the earth. That's pretty intense right there. But there was one guy, one man, Noah, who found favor in God's eyes. And looking at this from a godly perspective, we gotta ask ourselves whether as Christians, if you're a Christian here today, do you feel the same distress when you look at the world? When you look at the world, do you say, oh man, this is awesome? Or do you see the world for what it is? I mean, like this guy, Philip, what's his last name? I'm forgetting. Philip Seymour Hoffman, thank you. I mean, here's a guy, an uh, aw Academy Award winning actor. Fine, you, you, they, they go to his place, 70 bags of heroin. The needle was still stuck in his arm. And, you know, my heart goes out to his family. And it just shows you, I mean, even more so, why we need to have a chemical recovery ministry. And why, you know, we need to rejoice that Anita has graduated from it. But that, you know, the, the truth of it is, it's not just because we're just nice people that are getting a program together. It's the power of God. It's the spirit of the living God working in true baptized disciples that enable them to overcome. Because apparently this guy, sadly, they say that he relapsed after 23 years. But, I mean, honestly, I don't know how much of a relapse that is. I mean, you go from nothing to 70 bags of heroin? Maybe there was stuff going on behind the scenes. You know, you don't, that, that's a huge. But the sad part about it is now the media, instead of saying, you know what, you know, this is very sad, it's more like, well, he's a victim. And I'm like, why is it that anytime people talk about sin, 
they always, at least in the world, they always victimize the sinner. Instead of realizing, no, actually, you need to repent. And if you actually have people holding you accountable, maybe you would. Come on. But that's another message. We do need to pray for his family and for his three children. But it just goes to show you, do you see sin in the world today? Hiding under the veneer of respectability. You don't know how many people, professors, teachers, doctors, actors, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Behind all their beautiful, grandiose balls, and the tuxedos, and the medals, and the honors, is wickedness. Sadly, the wickedness that, that will literally end their lives. Do you ask, and do you really have the same distress and grief in your heart the way God does here? That's what Paul had in Acts 17, remember? In Athens, he was looking around, he was distressed by the idols in the city. It's the same thing. And so, now if you really think about it too, what about the sin in your own life? Because sometimes we're very happy to see the sin in everybody else's life. But how about the defensiveness in your marriage? Right? Let's talk about the pride. Let's talk about the lust. Let's talk about the things that sadly you know are part of your character that you don't hate. Let's keep reading here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Everyone wants to find favor in the eyes of God, but no one wants to die to their sin to do so. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself. That's interesting. So make yourself. It doesn't say for yourself. Make yourself. I mean, you got to imagine, what team am I going to have to do this with? Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coach it with, co coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. He doesn't say you and your team. Can you imagine? Chosen to build the ark. It's all you, Noah. <laughs> the ark is to be 450 feet long. You can put up those pictures again, bro, if you have them. Oh, yeah. Oh, keep, keep, you can keep them scrolling. The ark is to be 450 long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it. Finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. Wow, that's intense. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You know, that's why we really need to go after our families. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of mammal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. Now, this is interesting. Here, what you're looking at is Noah's Ark versus the Titanic. Pretty interesting stuff. I'll get to that a little bit later. Which Ark do you want to be a part of? Which boat do you want to be a part of? You know what I'm talking about right there? Because, you know, the Titanic looked real pretty. The ark, maybe not as pretty. You know, it's kind of like the world. You look at the world, all oh, the world looks real pretty. But God's like, you need to be in the church, you need to be in the ark. I don't know, it doesn't look as good. Well, well. Now, let, now uh, this is going to scroll, but I need you guys to focus here. I, I know the pictures are pretty, 
But don't be distracted. It's the same picture. It's going to keep scrolling. So in case you start to doze, just kind of take a look and then you're good. All right, here we go. Now it says in verse 20, here it says, Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. See, this is one of the key things people always say. Oh, how did one dude, how did one dude bring all these animals into the ark? You've got to be crazy. What are you, running around after little, you know, birds? How are you going to catch the birds and bring them in? <laughs> right? Because they're ignorant of the Bible. What does the Bible say? It says they will come to you to be kept alive. Is that awesome right there? Can you imagine? You build it, and all of a sudden, doom, doom, doom. and these mammoth elephants, doom, they come to him. He's like, whoa, right? Whoa, this is crazy. Wow. And so it's interesting here because you've got to ask yourself, how would you have responded if God had said, you, Esperanza, are chosen to build the ark? The hope. The hope. You know what I'm talking about, Ricky? <laughs> Guys, this is intense. I mean, you see the, how massive this thing, and that's, that's to scale right there. Right? But for those of us who've made Jesus Lord of our lives, the truth of it is, guys, that he has chosen us to build his church for him. How do you feel about building God's church? Is it overwhelming sometimes? Is it like, whoa, I don't know. I mean, think about, here's Noah. Where am I going to get this stuff from? Where am I going to get the wood from? How am I going to start? By? I don't know anything about building. Like, where, how am I going to do this? You ever feel that way? Yeah. Then you're just like Noah. It's only by the power of God. You see, when it's beyond our understanding, that's when you know only God can do it through you. And so that's why you can truly rely on God and not give in to stress and anxiety. But what's really cool about this is the power of the Holy Spirit in writing the book of Genesis because despite the ancient date here, right, you could argue 450, 1450 BC or further back, the ark's dimensions... If you break it down, 30 by 5 by 3 are the pr precise requirements for any seagoing vessel today. Now, see, most people don't know that. But the ark's dimensions here are the same dimensions that the Navy uses in building ships today. They just do it on different scale, proportionally. And that's in the Word of God. Well, how did they know that? How did they know that? Carbon dated all the way back. How would they know that this proportion would be perfect? 2,000, 5,000, how many thousand years later we would be using the same stuff with all our wisdom and intelligence and technology? And the Titanic sank. Why? Because of ice. And we see what's happening right now. I'm trying to get our cars out of ice. I mean, I don't know about you, but this morning was no joke. Man, it's like, you see cars, they're like backed up on little, little mountains. They can't park because, I don't know what, well, let me not go into it. You know that, I'm not going to go into it. But, you know, the good news here is that I just think, amen, these, the, the animals came to Noah to be, to be kept alive. That, that's just really encouraging here. But what's also really encouraging, and what's interesting to notice, because I want you guys to study the word of God is that from the time Noah began building the ark to when the floodwaters came were approximately a hundred years. And you say, Andrew, well, how do you know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me, let me show you. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 5, it says, after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father, or was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, if you look in Genesis chapter 7, it says here in verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. Did you catch it? And so from the time God said, go build the ark, floodwaters are coming. Right? Gave him 100 years. Okay, so you think 100 years...
to build that. Because this is interesting too. What was he doing for those hundred years? Was he just getting the boat together? Maybe learning, you know, Cliff Note version of how to, dummy, <laughs> dummy's guide of how to build an ark, right? <laughs> well, let, let's turn over to 2 Peter. What else was he doing? Let's see what the Bible says. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. I wanted to kind of explain this and then we'll, we'll kind of hit the points in just a little bit. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, talking about God, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher? A preacher of righteousness and seven others. So what do we see here? For the hundred years, Noah was building and he was preaching. Are you with me here? You see, a lot of people say, well, you know, God is so mean. He looked at the world and he said, well, I don't like y'all because you're evil. Your thoughts are always bad all the time. And so, you know what? I'm going to destroy you. No, that's not what he did. He said, Noah, it's time to build the ark. Flood waters are coming. And you know what? I'm going to give you a hundred years to preach. Maybe somebody will repent. And no one repented. You ever feel that way? Yeah. You ever feel like Noah? Yeah. Here you are. You're spending your resources, yeah. money, effort, time to build the ark. Then you're out there preaching like, hey, a storm's coming. A storm is coming. Man, what you talking about? I'm trying to get married up in here. I'm trying to build my career. I'm trying to build my family. I ain't got time for this. But Noah's like, no, no, no. You don't understand. You need to be righteous. You need to get rid of this evil stuff in your life. Hey, come help me build it. No one came. No one believed him. But here's what's really powerful, guys. Despite the lack of results, he still found favor with God. See, I think sometimes we don't get the results we want. People don't come out of the church. People don't study the Bible. People don't get baptized. And all of a sudden, you sink down. You get discouraged. Maybe God's not showing me favor. Noah dealt with that for a hundred years. Jeremiah, that was his entire ministry. Now, we need to learn how to be more effective. But does that stop you from building and completing the work? Maybe you're thinking, well, because this hasn't happened in my life, I should stop contributing. I should stop giving. I should stop building God's kingdom. I should stop being sold out. I don't even know if this flood's coming anyway. Do you see the parallels here, guys? And so, we're trying to get as many people into God's spiritual ark as, as much as we possibly can. And so, no matter the result, we got to be preachers of righteousness here. In a world of evil to bring honor to God and win his favor. Well, let's get back to Genesis here. Genesis chapter 7, verse 13. It says here, On that day, that very day, no one is sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Oh, actually, before we do this, I, I want you to see something really quick here. Flip, flip back to chapter 6 real quick. I want to I make sure you see something. Because when God told Noah what to do, let's see how he responded. It says in verse... So let's start in verse 20 again. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Oh my gosh. So if it isn't enough to go build this thing. Amen, God, you hooked me up. They're coming to me. Okay, that, that helps a lot. Okay. But now I've got to go and get food for them? How am I get food for all these elephants? All the smallest. All the smallest stuff? Insects? But here, here's what's really risky. A male and female termite 
had to come on board too. What do termites eat? Oh, snap! No! No! I've just built the ark of what? No! Whoa! <laughs> what am I gonna do? Oh, no! I mean, you talk about faith, you talk about courage. Would God have chosen you? Verse 22. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Where's your heart this morning? Would God choose you to build the ark? Well, let's fast forward a little bit here. It says in Genesis chapter 7, let's start in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, wow, it just kind of lays it out right there. You know, the date, the time, everything. On that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and all the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 days. So it wasn't just rain from above. It was all the springs of the deep below. That's pretty intense. Whoa, it's coming at both ways here. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every kind of wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind. It sounds like a, a classification, like a scientific classification right there. Their species, their kind. The Bible's laying it on out. Pretty awesome. Everything with wings. Pairs of creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah, entered the ark. The, no, the animals going in were male and female, every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For 40 days, the flood came, kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose, covered the mountains to a depth more than 20 feet. So mount, imagine like Mount Everest. The waters cover Mount up and above, more than 20 feet above it. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarmed with the earth, all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living creature on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and creatures that moved along the ground, the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Can you imagine that? Imagine being with the animals that long. You know, sometimes you're, you're part of God's spiritual ark, and you're like, man, I'm kinda sh I feel shut up in here with you. Where does all the waste go? Man. Heck, I don't know. I don't, I'm not much liking this. You ever feel like you don't want to be in the ark? But then you realize, well, if I go outside, I'm going to die. So... Because I think sometimes you think, oh, it's going to be awesome. No, actually, you're just going to live. <laughs> but the good news, the door is going to open one day. And we're going to be with the Lord. Well, chapter 8, it says here, God remembered Noah. Amen. And all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the seventh day of the seventh month, 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Arat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand, took the dove, brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in his beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days, sent out the dove again, but this time... It did not return to him. 
By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark. You and your wife and your sons and wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures move along the ground, so they can multiply. That's always been God's purpose from when he created Adam and Eve, to multiply. And as Christians, what are we here? To be fruitful. And multi- what does that mean? We got to reproduce. We're not just talking about just physical reproduction. What are we talking about? Spiritual reproduction. We got to go save this world and make more men and women disciples. Amen. It says, multiply the earth, be fruitful and increase in number upon it. So Noah came out, together with his sons and wives and sons' wives. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth, came out of the earth, one kind after another. Then Noah built an ark to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Oh, amen. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. Doesn't say from birth. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? You're born in the sin. That's not what this says. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Let's stop here. Wow, it's pretty cool, huh? Well, it's interesting to notice here that, as I mentioned earlier, the Bible states that this whole genetic classification of species according to its kind, science didn't understand this type of classification of species at this time. But the Bible was talking about it. And so, you see all this happening here, and God giving them the promise, and then later on in chapter 9, he talks about the beautiful rainbow in the sky and how never again will I do that, right? It's sad to see how God's rainbow has been twisted today. The rainbow that symbolizes the salvation and the start of something new, the promise that I'll never do that to you again has now been twisted by the devil into something absolutely corrupt and evil once again. But the challenging part for us here is got to realize that despite God's patience, the day of the Lord is still coming. Take a look over in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, sometimes we think, oh, well, the, the flood won't come. Okay, that's good, but something else will. Let's take a look here and see what the Bible says. 2 Peter, chapter 3. Because I think the reason why you've got to ask yourself, why is it that I don't have the heart of Noah or the urgency of Noah? It's because I really don't believe that this is going to happen. Let's just be honest. If we really knew the date that God was going to come back, how would you live your life? If you knew that God was going to come back in the next 10 years, how would you live your life? Would you live your life the same way you're living it right now? You see what I'm saying here? With all the priorities you have? 2 Peter chapter 3. It says here, chapter 3, verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. You see it? By that same word, the present heaven and earth are reserved for fire. Whoa. So it's not water coming this time. Next time, what's coming? Fire. Being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. 
But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, we got to understand the heart of God here. You read Genesis, and if you don't see and connect the amount of time that it took for the, the rain to come, you would think, God don't care about nobody. No, God is patient. But he's also a God of justice. Everyone loves the God of love, but no one wants the God of justice, too. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, the earth and everything, and it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Let me ask you a question. Do you look forward to God coming back? Yes. Uh, when's the last, seriously, like I, honestly, this week, I haven't thought about it. When's the last time you thought, man, what if God comes back this week? Man. Am I ready? Are my friends ready? See, the thing is, is that when we don't follow this, which means look forward to the day of God and speed it's coming. Man, I wish it came already. The day will bring him on the destruction of heavens by fire. The elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. I want to encourage you all, as you look at this here, the one thing that's going to keep you focused, like the way Noah was focused, is understanding that God is coming. It's like that movie, Hell's Coming. What, what, what is, how, does it come, how does it go again? I'm coming, and hell's coming with me. Tombstone. You tell him I'm coming, and hell's coming with me. That's funny because Wes's son, soon to be son, his name's Wyatt. Did you get it from the movie? Wyatt Earp. That's what, Tim Tombstone, right. You got inspired from that? That's pretty awesome, bro. <laughs> you tell him I'm coming. Guys, wow. Well, but let, let's, let's put all this into practicals. I said I'd give you all the points at one time. Um, go back to Genesis real quick here. Hopefully you've gotten a lot of points as I've preached all this to you. But the question is, again, so why Noah? Of all the people on the face of the earth, why did God single out Noah with the task of building the ark? And so we need to see what qualities here, and hopefully we're going to review them as we've already studied it out now, the qualities that we need to have to be able to build God's church, his spiritual ark for this world. Well, if you look in Genesis chapter 6, it says in verse 9, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a what? A righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Okay, key point here. Noah had a blameless character. What does it mean to be blameless? Well, it means to be above reproach, right? When you walk into a school or your job or wherever else, do people automatically change what they say because they know your convictions? I remember I used to go into, I, I used to take a lot of uh, martial arts, and I'd walk into the dojo, and the guys would be talking, like, blanking this, blanking that, and as soon as they saw me, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Why? Because they knew, not just because they knew I was a minister, but they actually, I actually followed and did what I believed. Sadly, I've seen priests and rabbis cursing and yelling. Looking at women. I've seen it with my own eyes. Are we really blame? Are we above reproach? Um, on campus, teens, are you cheating on assignments and tests like all the other kids around you? Marrieds, how, 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 is, how is your life? How is your relationship? You know, it was awesome to go out with my wife last night. And um, we, you know, we didn't have the marriage devotional because apparently there was some mix up with the building here. They said that we could have it and then they said we can't. And so we we're going to have this whole murder mystery thing for the marrieds. Celebrate Valentine's Day. And so, hey amen, we couldn't have it. And so my wife and I, 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 was, able to, I was able to get a, I had a gift card that a brother gave me. 
$100 gift card. And, uh, and so I was like, hey, man, the Lord is good. <laughs> and on it were these different like, restaurants like near Times Square. Oh. And so we were able to go out. Uh, I'll tell you the name of the restaurant. It's Trattoria dell'Arte or something like that. This, I mean, this spot, the maitre d' is like, how are you? So good to have you here. What is your name? Andrew. Andrew, come with me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not over-exaggerating. And it's like so good, because it's right across from Carnegie Hall. So a lot of people go there, eat, and then, you know, and like, you know, the food is like serious. And so, and you know, I mean, every, I, you know what makes a restaurant awesome is like the, the staff. And so it wasn't like one of those stuffy restaurants. I mean, the one, he hands it off to the assistant maitre d', maitre d', come, come with me, I'm going to bring you over. Hey, uh, this guy, John, come on over, he's the third best waiter in the restaurant. Ha <laughs> ha, and they're laughing. Ha ha ha. They're going around, and, and they're like laughing, and they're talking. They're, you know, oh, let me, uh, here's, here's, a, here's a bottle of uh, Moscato just for you to enjoy. Here's this, here's that, free, two, I mean, it's like, I'm like, man, that's what they do in Times Square? Okay. Now, the food is <laughs> a amount of money, but... <laughs> you look at you open the <laughs> you open the thing and it's like how much? <laughs> but it was good. It was good. It was great. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> you could probably yeah. I mean, not the whole car, but it was, it was serious. Um. But you know, marriage. Like, how's it going in your relationships? Is it any different than the world? Um. How high is our standard? I think that's what it, really, what it boils down to. Because, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that to be blameless you gotta be perfect. Take a look over in Genesis 9 with me. I wanna show you something here. Because after Noah did this amazing victory, saved all these people, what happened? Noah, Noah, Genesis chapter nine, it says here, verse 20, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. What? The man that God chose to build the ark became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. The, the man was so drunk, he was naked. You know, it's interesting here because... After doing great deeds for the Lord, we can go back to the world and fall right back into sin. You know what I'm talking about right there? Yeah. Hey Amen. I'm sure he repented, but to think that God could use a drunk. And now, I, I, I shouldn't say that. He wasn't a drunk before. He doesn't say that. But God knew that he had the capacity to be that and to get drunk. Now, it's funny. I was talking to my beautiful wife last night about this. And she was like, you know, I kind of wonder, why did he give, give in to drinking? Maybe because he saw the bodies floating in the water. You know, a lot of people, you wonder why they become alcoholics? The world can have an effect on you. I just interesting thoughts. But I think the challenge for us is we need to make sure that after doing great things for God, we don't go back to the world and get spiritually drunk. Spiritually naked, doing nothing. And so we got to make sure, like Noah, we have an attitude that truly is blameless. Another area here is just reliance on God. Number two is really reliance on God, because what do you see here? As we saw back in Genesis 6, 9, he not only was blameless, he what? He walked with the Lord. How's it, how is it really going for you? You know, this year is what, the year of what? Prayer. Did you pray this morning? Did you pray this morning? Did you really get down on your knees or wherever you were and just prayed? Because you see, I know for me, if I'm not praying, I'm not relying on God. And I'm prideful. Because I think I don't need God to get through my day. That's what you're saying. And so, he didn't just have a good reputation. Um, he had a noble character. He truly walked with God. Ask yourself, your Bible study, your prayer, are you really relying on God or are you just relying on your own strength? Number three, another characteristic here is that he had complete obedience to God. I showed you this in Genesis 6, right? It says here in Genesis 6, 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. But then look at chapter 7, verse 5. Noah did 
You with me? Chapter 7, what does it say? No one did? All that the Lord commanded him. Time and time again, he obeyed everything. Now, what's interesting about this, guys, is that this is something for us as Christians today that we can kind of get uh, confused by. We live in today in a world that's very religious. A lot of people claim to follow God. A lot of people call themselves Christians. But there's not complete obedience. So they say, well, I follow God. I have a Bible just like you. I, I say that I've made Jesus Lord. Okay, well, how do you become a Christian? Um, well, I was watching Creflo Dollar on the TV, and he said, you know what, pray this prayer with me, and now I'm a Christian. So you didn't repent of your sins. Repent, what does that mean? Oh. Uh, you don't have anybody in your life keeping you accountable. No. Do you read your Bible every day? No. Do you share your faith? No. But you're a Christian. Yeah. Do we do everything that the Bible commands? Because according to my Bible in Acts 2.38, it says you got to repent and what? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Which means that if you haven't repent and gotten baptized as a true disciple, because Matthew 28 says, go make disciples, baptizing who? Them. So who's a candidate for baptism? A disciple, which means if you're not a true student and follower of God, how can you be ready to get baptized? It doesn't make any sense. People say, I got baptized as a baby. Really? What did you know as a baby? Did you have faith in Jesus? Were you ready to repent? And there, there are millions, if not billions of people today that believe, hey, I got baptized as a baby, therefore I'm a Christian. Oh, and yeah, that's right. I went and took confirmation classes that explained to me why I got baptized in the first place after I got baptized. I took the bar exam, and then I went to law school. <laughs> Guys, look. the problem is there are people today that don't know what it means to be a Christian. Why? Because there are false teachers out there today. Take a look over with me in 1 Peter. We're going to close out the next five minutes here. I, I want to show you this because we got, we got to make sure in a world of religiosity that we don't get swayed by persecution. Because very often, the very people who are religious are the very people that will persecute you. I.e., who killed Jesus? Was it the Romans? No, it was the Jewish ruling council. It was the people that were supposed to be the most religious. They're the ones that persuaded the crowd to ask for Jesus to be crucified and let Barabbas, a murderer, go. Don't forget. Don't be faked out. I know what it's like to be religious and yet not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I grew up going to church all my life, playing the organ, doing all this nonsense, and I was still just as impure and lustful and deceitful and immoral as anybody else. How about you? 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says here very clearly, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring into God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. There it is again, right? God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, in what? In the ark, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. Talking about the flood water, right? Well, why are they saved through water? Because the flood water washed all those sinful people away. Verse 21. And this water, referring to the flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. That now what? Saves. So what's the symbol? The flood or baptism? But you know, Baptists today believe that baptism is just an outward sign of an inward faith. That's the symbol. You, you, you're saved when God comes into my life. Amen. I'm saved. Can you show me that scripture where it says, pray this prayer into your heart, please? Oh, Revelation 3? Oh, uh, no. Revelation 3 is talking to people who are already baptized disciples. Sorry, try again. You see what I'm saying here? People don't know their Bibles. And sadly, the world is being led astray. The Bible says here, 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, this water, the flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, 
When Alfred and Crystal get in, get in the baptistry today, it's not because they haven't showered or taken a bath this morning. All right, Alfred? Amen. So the point here is that that water, <laughs> it symbolizes baptism. Then that says, not the rule of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. I've repented. I've died to my sin. I'm ready to get married to the Lord. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers, in submission to him. In the same way Jesus died on the cross, buried in the tomb, rose from the dead, we die, we die to our sins, we're buried in the waters of baptism, and we raised to new life. It's a spiritual parallel. But, Romans 6, it's very clear. So why aren't people following complete obedience to God? It's because they love the tradition more than the truth. Well, the last two here, why did God choose Noah? Is because his character, he had truly had a priority of worship. And I say this because imagine you're Noah, you built the ark, and you've been cooped up with these animals in tight quarters for over a, you know, a long time. God is giving you the permission to come out. What's the first thing you do? Go explore the surroundings? Maybe kind of, you know, you get your legs, you know, do a little jumping jacks or whatever, right? Five somersaults, when you go hunt for food, what do you do? It says here, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, let's take a look. What does it say, guys? Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The first thing he did after disembarking was to worship. Does it remind you of Matthew 6, 33? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We're here today to worship God, guys. We believe that this is the most important thing we do this week. Do you believe that's the most important thing? Yeah. Because if that's not the case, then you don't want to make meetings of the body. Then your heart doesn't want to make midweeks or Bible talks because your priority of worship is not the same. We got to make sure we're still worshiping God in spirit and in truth. My last point, guys, is that God chose Noah because he was willing to risk for the kingdom. He was a man of, who was willing to take the risk. You know, imagine your neighbors were building this kind of construction project. What would you think? You crazies all get out. You crazy. Like, guys, let's be honest. Right? You would think he needed to see a therapist, right? I think that's the same way the world thinks when we talk about raising a 20 times missions contribution this May. Whoa, whoa, hold on a second, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. You're saying you're gonna go and raise 20 times your regular contribution so that more churches can be planted? Yes. Why? Because we're building God's kingdom. Why? Because we want more people to be saved. What? Saved from what? Oh, you don't know? See, that's the problem. People don't think God's coming back. And so they don't think, and they think the world is fine teaching all this false religion, right? Nowadays, even the Pope's like, oh yeah, whatever you guys want to do, who am I to judge? Our God is changing. You got the Joel Osteens and you got all these guys that are teaching all this nonsense, you're like, amen. No wonder the world's being led astray. Guys, we're trying to keep people alive. And be praying, guys. February, March, and April. We're trying to give 10% of what we need to give. It's about, actually, I appreciate, uh, Mike, we had talked about 120 at one point. But the good thing is we're going to be able to give some now and some later. So our actual goal is going to be about 102. Amen. That's, 20, that's almost $20,000 less. Amen? Amen? But if you really want to go for it, let's go for it anyway. Now, now here's the thing. Each month, though, we need to raise about 10% of that. So that's about 10 grand. Now, if you really think about it, there's 113, 116 people in the church. If everybody gives 100 bucks this month, we're done. Oh, that's, 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 that's it. That's like saving, don't go to Starbucks. Maybe fast for a meal once a week. And oh my gosh, you're, you're saving money like crazy. Instead of spending like $5 on a cap, you know, mocha cappuccino, whatever you get over at Starbucks. Guys, we can do this. We've done it before, and God will do it through us again. And so remember, this is all so that we can keep people alive. You know, um, 
I don't know what risk you're taking, but Noah is a man of risk. What we do takes risk. But what does risk take? Faith. And I want to encourage you guys here as I close. You know, as I said, it probably took a lot of faith and courage for, to, to when that male and female termite started walking on board right there. <laughs> Noah must have been like, oh, snap. You know what? And sometimes the fear of failure stops us from dreaming. But we got to trust in our God that his word never comes back empty, guys. You know, um, I'll close with this quote. You know, it's interesting. Noah, a lone amateur, built the ark. Noah, one man. I don't know if you got people to help him or not. But a lone amateur built the ark through the instruction of God. A large group of professionals in this world built the Titanic. Which boat do you want to be on? Let's give God the glory he deserves and build his spiritual ark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew, so much for uh, that incredible lesson from Genesis series. Guys, let's stand on up. Let's sing number 372 in our song books, I Am Resolved. Come on, bro. Mm, one, two, ready. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. Oh, we're singing. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, Jesus greatest, highest, highest.